Janine Yunus is litigation counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, and uh, a couple of different attorneys general, along with the NCLA, have now formally attacked this issue. And it's an important one. In fact, it was addressed yesterday at the White House. The um, White House press secretary, Pepe Le Pew, asked directly about handing over this information and their role in trying to silence COVID information. Here's what she said. Um, so, a federal judge talked about the social media uh, lawsuits from Missouri and Louisiana. A federal judge ordered that you have 20 days to turn over emails uh, communicating with social media companies over misinformation and uh, disinformation. Um, what are those emails going to show? What kind of communication? So, I can't comment. You asked me this question last week. Uh, I can't comment on any specifically ongoing uh, litigation. And so, again, I refer you, we would refer you to Department of Justice. A couple of things that I would say on just as a general matter on this, uh, as we've said over and over again since the beginning of the administration in our battle against COVID-19, it has been critical for the American people to have access to factual, accurate, science-based informa in, information and ensuring that any media platforms have access access to latest information on a once in a generation pandemic is something that has been done since the earliest days of the pandemic. Yeah, there it is again, that Orwellian speech. It's another version of the Vivek Murthy comment. The American people have the right to access credible science based. We've been working with social media to make sure the American people have access to science based information. It's creepy stuff. The American people have the right to information not your version of information. Janine Yunus, we welcome you in. I, I, th this was creepy to me two years ago when it was coming from Vivek Murthy. We now know they were actively keeping information they didn't want us to see, and they keep insisting yeah. it's for our own good, which is how all good <laughs> fascists and dictators talk, right? Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's, it's really disturbing. So as you noted, the extent of the censorship enterprise is much greater than we had ever realized before. Um, we, you know, now know that it spans 11 agencies, at least there may be more that haven't been identified yet. And around a hundred federal officials that were involved in directing social media companies to censor people. <laughs> and Alex Berenson, one of the more prominent figures who sued Twitter over this already and got uh, through discovery documents that absolutely confirmed the white house very specifically by name said, what are we going to do about him? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So there are a couple of people. Naomi Wolf, too, was specifically targeted um, by the White House. And then uh, two of our clients who were representing in the lawsuit, uh, Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Kuldorf, they were co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, which people may have heard of. It um, was written, they're epidemiologists who wrote it in October of 2020 and said that lockdowns were doing more harm than good and should be ended immediately and not <laughs> ever reinstated. Um, they were immediately targeted by the White House, especially by Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci, who I assume everyone knows. Um, and, you know, uh, Fauci especially said their ideas were dangerous. They needed to be um, silenced and they were censored extensively on social media. So I'm very uh, interested, shall we say, in what the emails from Fauci and some of the other very high ups at the White House show. Did you, to, to be, I want to be fair and clear about this, was this exclusively under the Biden administration, or did we see some of this under the Trump administration, too? That is, these agencies headed by people like Fauci and Collins. Right. It looks as though um, some of this was going back earlier, although the emails that we have now, I, I haven't seen anything from before. Um, well, right. So some of it, you're right, did take place under the uh former administration. I mean, I haven't seen anything from, you know, Trump or anything like that. Um, it looked right. Like, like no indication that the Trump speech. White House yeah. was involved, but his, no, you know, the people no. around him advising yeah. him were. Yeah, that, that's right. Well, and the C, like the CDC um, certainly was doing this before uh, Biden took over, but it, it escalated significantly um, once, you know, under the new administration. Yeah, like the the. Um Alex Berenson stuff suggests that senior, uh, you know, senior advisors in the White House very specifically and directly interacted with Twitter about him. Right. I mean, that, that, like the oh, White yeah. House directly got involved. Well, we know now from and that was actually from discovering his own case, not from ours. Um, he uh, 
had been on Twitter, had had communications with Twitter executives where he was assured that he would not be taken off, uh, that he hadn't violated any rules. And then he was permanently suspended just days after um, Fauci singled him out and said Alex Berenson presented a danger for suggesting that some young people don't need to get the vaccine. Um, And then a discovery in his case against Twitter revealed that uh, Twitter employees had been communicating and saying that the White House had tough questions about why Berenson hadn't been kicked off. Mercifully, we had answers. And that word is very important because the uh, government's defense in the, these cases, because this isn't the only one, there are some related ones, has been that the tech companies want to do this. And if the government and tech companies want to work together to accomplish mutual aims, then they can do that. Um, that, in my opinion, is a really uh, uh, not not good interpretation of the First Amendment. Um, the two can't work together anyway to silence uh, the viewpoints of certain people that disagree with the administration or certain viewpoints, period. And uh, in any event, the inherent power imbalance, you know, where the government has been threatening the companies with um, repercussions if they don't do what the government says uh, and they have the authority to carry that out means this is not voluntary on the tech company's part. I want to go back to the Joe Rogan, Mark Zuckerberg audio, uh, because I think that's an important component of this, too. Janine Yunus is with us, litigation counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance, uh, along with the Attorney General of Missouri and the Attorney General of Louisiana, all three entities filing a lawsuit, uh, blowing the lid off a sprawling federal censorship re- regime. It's, it's, it's shocking. And, you know, when you hear... Mark Zuckerberg, so casually, I, I think Rogan did an outstanding interview with him because he made Zuckerberg feel so comfortable in admitting something very chilling. Let's listen to this again. I'd love to get your reaction, Janine. How do you guys handle things when they're a, a big news item that's controversial? Like there was a lot of attention on Twitter during the election because of the Hunter Biden laptop story, the New yeah, York we Post. Yeah, we too. Yeah, so you guys censored that as well? So we took a different path than Twitter. Um, I mean, basically, the background here is the FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some some folks on our team, and was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was, the, we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump of, of um uh, uh, that's similar to that. So just be vigilant. So our protocol is different from Twitter's. What Twitter did is they said, you can't share this at all. Um, we didn't do that. What, what we do is we have, um, if something is reported to us as potentially um, misinformation, important misinformation, we we also have this third-party fact-checking program because we don't want to be deciding what's true and false. And no, no, no. for the, I think it was five or seven days when it was basically being... Um, being determined whether it was false, um, the distribution on Facebook was decreased, but people were still allowed to share it. So you could still share it, you could still consume it. So when um, you say the distribution is decreased, in, it, it got shared. It, how does that work? It basically the ranking in newsfeed was a little bit less, so fewer people saw it than would have otherwise. So it definitely by what percentage? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's 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 meaningful. But I mean, but basically. A, um... <laughs> yeah, so you get the point. Uh, oh, the, the distribution was much less. Like, how much less, asks Rogan. Well, m- most most people. So basically banning it from sight is basically what sucker for you. Yeah. But uh, and I know this is related to Hunter Biden, but I think you could apply the very same thing to COVID, could you not, Janine? Yeah, you can. And actually, this is part of the lawsuit, although we're not representing plaintiffs on that issue. But the Hunter Biden laptop story and the suppression of it uh, at the government's behest is part of the lawsuit. Um, yeah, it's really quite astonishing. I mean, this is uh, it, it's really the government, um, you know, a government agency interfering in an election <laughs> and the election results. We know it may very well have been differently or come out differently if uh, if that story hadn't been censored. And, I, you know, I'm personally not a Trump person, but I like believe in fair elections. <laughs> so this is a, bit of a, a novel thought. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. so, the, but we can assume then, I mean, if Zuckerberg is this candid, oh yeah, the FBI came to us and said, hey, we think you've got some misinformation on your hands, you need to do something about it, and we yeah. dutifully complied. I mean, we can only apply and assume that that same strategy uh, was in effect and employed with COVID. 
Oh yeah, well yeah, and we know we know now <laughs> that it was. Um, there was there is some speculation that this was a few days before we were releasing the discovery. There was some um, talk that maybe Zuckerberg was trying to get out in front of that um, because we were all, the judge in the case also granted discovery on um, third party discovery, so we were allowed to get documents and ask questions of up to five tech companies, and we obviously chose you know Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Google and LinkedIn. Um, so they were giving us documents as well. And that's actually how we learned about the involvement of more agencies than we had realized. The government wasn't forthcoming about that. They uh, told us only about a limited number. And then we found out there were more based on the, the, the discovery from the tech companies. What ultimately is the legal remedy here, do you think? I mean, in, in a in a just, open, free society that values the First Amendment and the government not censoring people, I, I, I'm sure the defense will be, hey, listen, we're a private company. We're under no obligation to do anything. We can do whatever we want. And if we want to coordinate and comply with government requests, we can. So what? What would you say about that legally? Well, yeah, right. I mean, that um, they may, the tech companies may take that approach. However, the First Amendment law in this area is not clear, mainly because social media is pretty new. And we, ha- we don't have a lot of cases like this. We don't have any cases like this, actually. So it's a little fuzzy, like exactly how these principles apply. It's my position that the government, you know, using tech companies, even if they're, they both want to be doing this, to suppress a cer- certain perspectives among Americans is a First Amendment violation. Um, so you're right that the tech companies may say that. The government will certainly say that, and that's what they've been saying. The tech companies want to do this. They can, they can work with us. We both, we both have the same goals. Um, the tech companies might not want to do that because under that theory, then they could be considered government actors and they could be sued. So they may want to say, um, you know, we were coerced. This was not voluntary. Uh, Well, it sounds to me like Zuckerberg basically says we were, you know, whipped little pups. The FBI came to us and told us to do something. How, you know, who are we to say no to the FBI is kind of the way Zuckerberg sounded. Yeah. And that's how these emails. So, you know, the, the discovery that we released last week, I think it was. Um, that's how these emails read. You know, it's clear that the people at the tech companies feel themselves to be in a subservient position to the government. They have to do what the government tells them. Um, there are texts from Jen Easterly and DHS, who, because DHS, it turns out, was much more extensively involved in this than we had realized, um, saying to another uh, employee in the CISA, the cybersecurity subcomponent of DHS, We have to get these tech companies to overcome their hesitancy to work with the government. Um, You know, that means they didn't want to be working with the government. And the the mercifully email I cited to earlier in the Alex Berenson case, I mean, this is obviously the government course in these companies. And this should be, I mean, I believe it will be a groundbreaking First Amendment case. I hope you're right. Um, I, I watch with eager anticipation. The attorneys general of Louisiana and Missouri... Uh, part of this as well is is that important is that significant yeah well and uh, to be clear also the missouri the louis sorry the missouri attorney general is leading the case so he's um you know he he's a great attorney he's doing a great job um they are suing on behalf of the citizens of their state the um, attorneys general cannot represent private parties so um there were these, these two great Barrington scientists I mentioned earlier, Aaron Cariotti, Jill Hines, and Jim Hoff, two owns the Gateway Pundit, uh, had wanted to um, join the case. And so NCLA joined in order to represent them, except for Jim Hoff, who's being represented by another private attorney. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, the attorneys general have more resources than us, you know, so it's helpful in that way. Where does this wind up? Is this does this immediately go to a, a, a federal court, the Supreme Court? How, how does this play out? Well, it's in a federal court now. It's in the Western District of Louisiana. It, the government could. So the latest update was that um, the judge ordered uh, the government had been <laughs> resisting turning over emails and having Anthony Fauci ask questions and a, and uh, his and Biden's press secretary Jean, Jean Pierre uh, and a couple of other high up people at HHS. Um, the judge ordered them to comply and to do so within 21 days. So they could appeal that uh, to the Fifth Circuit, which is the House court in that region. Um, it could go from there to the Supreme Court. They could decide not to appeal it. Um, 
I wouldn't if I were them because I don't think they're going to win. <laughs> we're on pretty solid legal ground, but they could. I, boy, we this has such an important outcome, I think, for the country and our future and how we consume and get information and share information with one another. So we hope you prevail, Janine Yunus, uh, with the new Thank Civil Liberties Alliance. Thank you so much for your time today. I hope you'll come back. Thank you.